the 2022 VW GLI. This is VW's most recent mid-cycle refresh of this car, which means when you get into the interior space, it's now a mix of old and new electronics, which honestly is not a bad thing. This is still based on the prior generation of MQV, which means you are not plagued with VW's most recent suite of interior electronics. You still have physical HVAC controls and infotainment controls, not to mention that. All of your core controls for interacting with the vehicle, like your traction control switch and your drive modes are also physical, which is a huge plus. When it comes to the infotainment system, it's lifted right out of the 7.5 Golf R or GTI, which means you have wireless Apple CarPlay, Android Automotive. There are few gimmicks in this cabin and the control structure, at least in the head unit, is fairly logical. Your gauge pod is entirely digital in this car. It works quite well, and you have a lot of good auxiliary information. That said, they did manage to sneak in their most recent steering wheel control layout, which means it's entirely haptic and covered in piano black. It's not the most intuitive to use, and it gets very dirty very quickly. When it comes to the audio system in this car, it's done by Beats, and it's not a high point by any means. It is rather lacking when you compare it specifically to the audio system found in the Civic Si or the Bose audio system found in the Mazda 3. It's a shame because this cabin otherwise is very quiet and has a low noise floor, particularly for its class of vehicle. When it comes to the overall ergonomics in this car, they're very good. You have good visibility, the door cards have a ton of storage, and the seats front and rear are very comfortable. You have good legroom back there, and the trunk space is enormous. The front seats are covered in leather, and they are pretty good. They are heated and cooled, unlike what's found in the Civic Si, and they fit a wide variety of body types. There's also minimal piano black in this cabin, which again is another big plus. But with all that said, I think it's time for us to head into the shop and put this thing up on the lift. We are underneath the GLI Jetta. We're going to talk about some of the mechanical changes or the changes to this car and the mentality behind it. Yeah, so this is the 2022, which means it's a mid-cycle refresh. You get new front and rear fascias, and you have a new exhaust system along with some of the interior changes that I talked about earlier. But when it comes to the actual car itself, this is largely a carryover product versus the prior GLI and the prior generation GTI. That's right. This is built on the last generation of MQB, which is VW's front-wheel drive platform. And unlike the current generation GTI, this is built in Mexico, and the mentality behind the GLI is it's supposed to be for a more cost-conscious buyer. But the demographics are pretty interesting. Yeah, and they've skewed this, really. The mentality behind this car is to give you all the features, all the performance, and all the things, and try to undercut some of the other brands, or specifically SI and WRX. It's a more mature package. It's for someone, demographically, that is a little bit older than the SI WRX owners. It's more male skewed. They make more money. They have more kids. They're more muscular and they might have a better hairline as well. We don't know. And they're a buyer that wants the, at least the image of prestige without the boy racer look. Yes, this, it, when you look at the exterior of the, this car, and that's something that I talked about in the previous GLI, why is it so sedate? Why is it kind of not edgy? There's no flair to it. And that's by design. It really is trying to capture that Jetta customer but amping it up with the performance and still maintaining maturity, something you can drive every day, have most of the features. And what did they do here in terms of feature set? So this is, again, based on the last generation of MQB, which means you don't get any of the new improvements like the VDM, the Vehicle Dynamics Manager, or the aluminum front subframe, or all the advancements to the suspension. But when it comes to suspension, this is still strut front, multi-link rear, and unlike something like the ESA, you get adaptive dampers. And the suspension tuning in the GLI is near identical to the suspension tuning in the 7.5 GTI. When it comes to the front end of this car, you have a VAQ diff, which is a clutch back based limited slip, which is entirely electronically controlled, with XDS, which is their torque vectoring by brake. You have two different gearboxes. You have a seven speed dual clutch or a six speed manual. They are largely similar to what's found in the GTI. And you have one engine, the last version of the E888 found in the 7.5 GTI, which means it makes about 228 horsepower, 240 or 250 foot pounds of torque, and it's pretty powerful. Yeah, so you have uh, one of the more powerful engines, you have better gearbox options, you now have Golf R brakes, yes. the standard, and this is a mono spec car. The GLI no longer splits off its trim levels and all these different things. What you see is what you get here, and that's what the value part of this is. Let's go tear up the GLI. All right, let's do it. Back in the GLI, Jack. Let's see how she does in inclement weather. All right. It's 
It's quick. Yes, it is. It's quick. And I forgot how quick it was, especially when you compare it to something like the SI and whatever the hell else we're talking about here. This is a very surprisingly fast car. I think the E888 is a very underrated engine. Yes, you have carbon buildup issues and some other things here and there, but it makes really good power. The dual clutch in this is... I mean, it's not the sportiest thing in the world, but it shifts relatively quickly. For a street car that you're driving every day, and this is, again, VW's argument that somebody that is buying this is enjoying it on a daily commute. It's not supposed to be a, it's not supposed to be a sports car replacement. It's going to be the vehicle that you're going to drive every day, and you want the modern-day comfort, which means transmission programming is not the sharpest. You can tell when you get off the ground that that clutch is almost like in you know, a slipping state. It's it, to smooth out the shifts and it will change its programming based on like how you're driving it as well. But it, it's never like a slam shift. The suspension is not overly harsh. The engine power delivery is never like snap your head back. It's the things you love about a GTI in a sedan body. Yeah. I, I will say, if it came down to manual versus automatic, the manual I think is a sportier option because if you were autocrossing this car, or taking it on like an HPD or track day, this DSG will auto upshift. Yeah. So if that, you're in between corners, it might be a problem. Yeah, that, that would be the one knock I'd have about it is it doesn't allow you any type of control of the transmission. I mean, you can you can hit the paddles to downshift and things, but it's always upshifting no matter what. The traction stability control, at least the traction control part, is hyperactive. Even with it off, trying to cross the street with uh, salt on the ground, it's just constantly cutting power. You can only go into stability sports. So traction will be off. It'll give you a little bit of slip, but just like in the Mark 7 GTI, it'll end the fun pretty quickly yeah. if, it, if it feels like you're getting totally out of sorts and that's the argument against this car is something like a SI or WRX does the sport part better yeah a absolutely the, this is more of that car that is just it's a sedan that they put a turbo on with kind of like the sporty like GTI heritage part and there's nothing wrong with it that honestly you have good good brakes for a 30 ish thousand yes, dollar car the brakes are strong you have a very powerful engine you have a mechanical electronic limited slip in the front it, it does it checks all the boxes i just think it's to me at least having now driven sort of everything but the elantra and in this segment it feels the most grown up uh, to me it also is the most sedate I would, I would say that uh, it, it, it lacks, and this is the problem I had with the first GLI that we did. I'm like, you know, you want a sporty car, but it's basically a sleeper car that doesn't have a lot of emotion to it. The outside is very kind of like mature, almost bland. The interior is completely functional, but there's no flair to it. And, you know, you look at something like the Mazda 3, you look at the Civic Si, and to some cases the WRX, they have a more youthful feel. And so if you're somebody that wants that, this is not the car for you. This is like what they talk about demographically. People that are a little bit older have the kids. They, they don't want the They flair. don't want any penalty either. Yes. This car rides well. It's surprisingly quiet. You get good fuel economy, and if you do want to go fast... No, you're right. It I, does go very fast for a four-cylinder. I understand it a little bit better this time around, and I, I'm less critical of it. I just expected that this was going to be more of a sporty driving experience, and while it does it does maintain the, the power, like the power is really impressive, mm -hmm. it's just they stripped all the fun out in the transmission programming, the stability control programming, it's always hampering your driving experience, which is why well, at least there's a manual, which imp will improve some of that, but it's not gonna fix the stability and traction control issue that just drags this driving experience down. So I don't know, it's like, if you want a mature car, why not just go to so like a, a luxury car that's not pretending as much to be uh, yeah, I get it. I think the value part of this car and the fact that it is in the very low $30,000 range, yeah. and you can go, if we pull it out of sport, we go into comfort, the adaptive dampers go basically pseudo entry-level luxury car soft, and you still have a good engine. Yeah, and yeah. All the refinement. So I think that dual personality in a price that that's, that is this, this reasonable. Low, yeah, yeah it's, I, it's that, nice. That's the best point, really, is the price. If this was more money, I'd have a much bigger problem with it, but it is a good alternative to those other cars that might even though those cars have become more mature, they still have maybe a little bit too much like, oh, I, hey, I'm like 25, or you want to be like, like The WRX is, now that we've driven it, it yeah. is hideous but great. Yes, yeah. And you wouldn't, to be fair, you would not want to go to like a funeral in a w, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the WRX we had. People would be like, what the hell? Or, you know, you go to a, a work event. Feeling, like I talked about in uh, the Toyota Highlander video, the last generation of it, 
there's this sense of ambivalence you feel towards this car because there's nothing particularly remarkably amazing about it. But at the same time, there's nothing really all that wrong with it either. So you're just left like, well, I wish it was better, but I'm glad it's not worse. And that's <laughs> not a, you know, that's not the greatest place to be in a car. Um, but, you know, again, it's different. In I, its I also think we're being more critical because this car is that enthusiast entry level yeah. air quote sports sedan, right? If, if you are coming from some total pile and this is going to be yes. your first sporty car that's brand new has a warranty all the luxury features that you've not had before this is a good car it's just you're right i wish particularly with the elantra n which again we have yeah. not driven that car is basically the same price yes it's very ugly but it's super fast if it's like the right. veloster n and it has that i guess that's what i'm yeah. getting at this is like the least compelling package overall and everything because it does everything kind of average or better than average there's not much to complain about it's just lacking some type of spirit that the other cars yes yeah, the like jack have. of all trades yeah, master or, of none or, yeah. right yeah so do you want to spend your money on something that has more emotion or do you just kind of want like to like the is more fun but is slower than this and yeah. i know that's really hard for people to understand Speed, again, you don't drive a spec sheet. Speed does not equate fun dynamics. So, right. Yeah, yeah, and I think even though the SI is slower than this, it's more fun to drive. But it, this it, is more refined, quieter. Right, faster, yes. straight line. Uh, so, it's an argument that you'll never win, and it depends on who you are, what cars you come out of in the past, your driving experience, and your brand affinities. All right, Mark, so with that, I think it's time for us to head into Funnel Thoughts. Sounds good. Final thoughts on the Jetta GLI. By now, you know what to expect with this. It's just a mature car. It's a regular sedan. It's somebody that wanted a Jetta, but wanted a little bit more. And that's about it. <laughs> the exterior lacks any flair or absurdness. It's not overstyled. The interior is functional. It's way better than the new generation of GTI with all the touch stuff. So you get the best of both worlds there. The driving experience engine, you know what to expect there. It's essentially a GTI or a Golf GTI 7.5. It drives very similar, it rides good, it's comfortable, it's quiet. There's nothing to complain about with this car other than maybe the transmission programming for the DCT and of course the, the reality of not being able to defeat traction and stability control. I mean, that, those are the two things from a performance perspective. This car is not a performance machine. It's just a, a classic sedan. And I'm going to leave it at that. We talked about everything else in the shop and, of course, in the drive. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next video.